timing could not be better. Not just because I've known this guy as long as I've been in the Ontario Hockey League. And he's a friendly thorn in my side. But as we head into draft weekend, we get to talk scouting with Mark Edwards of Hockey Prospect. Uh, Great to have you here. Thanks for making time at a busy time for you. Oh, I appreciate you having me. Good to see you always, Farwell. Yeah, you as well, my friend. So let's go back to those beginnings. Because I remember when you first kind of got into the scouting game, you were coming off time in coaching. What what led you to make the transition? Yeah, so when I was... um... So I started HockeyProspect.com in 2004, which we're coming up, it's going to be 20 years here. Um, so at the time, I was coaching Wayne Simmons. So, I mean, he's almost done his NHL career here, so it's time time's flying by. But uh, really, I was heavily into the coaching, still love coaching. Coaching would still be, you know, my number one choice. Um, but Hockey Prospect just kind of kept snowballing and becoming – bigger and more traffic and and gaining steam so to speak but originally I was just to the point where I was like some players are getting missed I'm going to start a website to try and draw some attention help some kids get some exposure to maybe some schools in the states and maybe get some scholarships that's really what it was and then it evolved from that into OHL draft starting the NHL draft rankings and like I said, it just snowballed into becoming a business and uh, what it is today. And and like I said, we're almost 20 years deep here. But at the time, it was really busy because I was doing both. Now, don't get me wrong. In 2004, I wasn't doing the kind of hours and travel that I'm doing now. That really didn't start until about year six, 2009, 10-ish, really around then. And the Black Book started in 2012, um, which became you know, took over for our NHL draft guide or the main piece, but still I was doing both. I can remember my last year coaching in junior A and it was with somebody, no, Jason Forche, who's now at University of Maine. Uh, we were playing in Kingston in the playoffs. And I remember getting home about one thirty in the morning and staying up till about four thirty in the morning, trying to f- finish up the black book. And, and I just said, that was the year I said, I can't do this anymore. And thank God, because as it is now, it's tough enough to get that sucker done, um, let alone when I was coaching at the same time, you know, three, four practices a week, a few games a week. And like I said, that was a bus trip, right? Coming home from Kingston and getting back to Vaughn at one in the morning, traveling home and working on a friggin' book till 4.30 in the morning. So that's kind of the roots of it. Uh, Wayne Simmons is, is uh, almost played it all out here, and he was – one of the first players I had a chance to coach Ryan O'Reilly, Petrangelo, some other guys before my coaching days were done uh, to Foley, who's still, still going and uh, tight with his father. Cause his father was heavily in board, involved with the junior Canadians, which is where I was coaching. So that's, that's the, 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 uh, the foundation. And it's just grown from there. It's uh that's an interesting benchmark with Simmons. And I just want to add, not trying to blow smoke, but, the black book that you refer to at hockeyprospect.com is kind of my Bible when it comes to draft eligibles. And I love the work that you and the, and the team does at hockey prospect. I want to zero in on one thing you said though, as part of the roots of this, and that is you thought players were getting missed. So obviously when you're, when you're coaching guys and you're seeing players on a regular basis, there weren't enough eyes on them and maybe they were being overlooked for future hockey opportunities. Yeah, no, I'm not trying to throw, you know, shade at anybody or any scouting staffs. There's still players missed. I just happened to be coaching at the midget, midget level at that time. So it was the kids that had come out of their OHL draft season and some of them undrafted. And I'm like, you know, these kids are, there's some pretty good players here. You know, and since that time, we've kind of grown and we have this, the U18 draft, right, for the OHL now. But that didn't exist way back then. And again, I wasn't doing it to necessarily find all kinds of players that the OHL scouts seemingly blew it on for the OHL draft. It was more just draw some attention to some guys that maybe went under the radar a little bit. Maybe it it is uh, uh, going to an OHL camp. Maybe it is a scholarship. But that's really how it started. And and like I said, it just snowballed from there into you know what it became uh, today. So. You alluded to it, Mark, and I hope you can give us some insight because I'm not sure everybody understands it. We talk on our broadcasts a lot. Oh, there are a lot of scouts in the building tonight. I know fans notice the scouts that are in buildings. Can you can you kind of give us a glimpse into a scout's life? I can't even imagine the hours that get put in, but what's it like? Yeah, well, obviously for us as independent, my budget's less. 
Um, so we have to be a little more creative here and there. But I try to do what I can to to keep us uh, as close to an NHL team uh, scout as possible. It's not going to be the same amount of trips out west or to Europe or that sort of thing. We just don't have the budget. But within this area, and then I will make the, the odd trip to Europe, out west, whatever, to the east coast to go see some Atlantic guys play in their home rinks, whatever the case may be. It, it varies by the year because the players kind of dictate, right? Who are the A and B players? You're not you're not flying across the, the country to go see a, a, a C-ranked player, a fourth rounder, right? The NHL guys don't even do that. Um, so that I guess that's a good place to start. So at the start of the year, all the teams will have their area scouts. They'll start attacking their area. And really, people think you're trying to create a list. Well, really, you're trying to knock people off your list. You're trying to make your list shorter. You're trying to 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 find teams you might not have to watch anymore, right? So maybe it's it's North Bay next year, um, and I'm just throwing them out. But but maybe they don't have really any eligibles. They might have one, and you just deem them to be maybe a bubble guy at best or whatever. And you just know I'm not going to be going to North Bay a lot, or they're not going to be on my schedule a lot. Whereas conversely, another team might have four eligibles, two are high-profile A players, possible A players, and you just know you're going to be watching that team a lot. And then more so for, you know, um, you know, you throw a Todd button lives in, in, in the area near me here. Right. So as director of scouting for the flames, he's going to get all his, his area guys eventually reporting in, and he's going to have basic grades. So he's going to start attacking the A's and B's from all those areas. He's going to make his schedule and plan a trip out West where, you know, he might be Portland, Seattle, up to Vancouver, like this year there was guys right in Penticton so they're uh, scooting over to the BCHL that's the basis of it in the fall you're trying to find out okay here's the big list our A's B's C's the area guys will keep watching the C's director of scouting or crossover scouts the crossover scouts being some senior guys on their staff that travel as well will focus on those A's and B's, but they'll watch C's. Obviously, if they're in the game, they're not going to close their eyes to them when they're in the same game as some A's and B's. And that's that's kind of how it starts. And then as you make your way through the season, you slowly shorten that list. You cross guys off. Maybe they're not a fit. Maybe you've already got, you know, three small guys in, in your lineup. Maybe you've already got two small defensemen. So there might be some small D you've just kind of said, hey, yeah, he's going to get drafted high. But for us personally, for a fit right now, he's not our guy. Don't need to go back to wherever, right? Moose Jaw to, to see him or whatever the case may be. But that's kind of what I do just on a smaller scale. So our guys report in, they give me their grades. Obviously, I'm watching myself. Obviously, you've seen some of the players the year before, but you're not watching it with that same, um, same eye, right? You're not being as picky guy jumps out of you for working hard or the odd smart decision catches your eye. But really, you know, you got to remember as scouts, you're not sitting there as a fan watching the whole game. You've got certain focus of who you're watching within that game. So you come away focused on three or four or five, sometimes a lot of players, maybe eight in a game. Um, you know, I've, I've always poked my head in and, and say hello to you. And, and part of a scout's job is, is doing a little bit of research. So, I'd be crazy not to pop my head in and say, Hey, you know, how's so-and-so been on for Kitchener this year? You know, what do you think of them? It doesn't mean I'm going to be just turn around and go home without watching the game. And a firewall says he sucks. So he's on our list, but you know what? You can say, Hey, like he's been a lot better lately. I think he's coming along and just so you know, he's a fantastic kid, whatever. Well, there's one vote in the fantastic kid department, right? Which is, you want to know. I'm not saying it's it's necessarily the end of the world, but you'd rather have a bunch of good kids than possible problems, obviously. So that's just a little bit of how it starts in the process. How much time would you actually spend at home from fall to spring? Um, a little bit more now because since COVID hit, we've we've purchased instat which is one of the video services so i actually use kitchener a lot as my example because they have those tuesday nights and you've seen it like sometimes there's 35 40 guys there and there's no one in the game <laughs> there's not even a really a prospect in the game i used to be one of those guys that went anyway and you know because it was just like well there's a game like and it's the only game in the ohl tonight so that's the game well i'm not doing that anymore you know the difference being 
uh, NHL guys are getting their per diem <laughs> and they're getting kind of paid to be there. It's costing me the 40 extra bucks in gas. Uh, gas has gone up. So being a little bit smarter in my old age here to uh, make better use of that time. And, I'm, you know, you still saw me on some Tuesdays in Kitchener, but I wasn't there if there was, you know, no prospects in the game, no, no real draft eligibles that interested us in particular, then that, that time is better spent for me being at home that particular night and throwing on the video software, we can pour through, you know, in an hour, we can throw, pour through three games of, you know, uh, of a certain player, right. They're just watching his shifts only and, and get three extra viewings of a player. So the NHL teams have all bought on, to, to this as well. I'm not saying all of a sudden no one's going to the games live. Everybody knows you got to go live. It, there's no substitute. But this video thing has become a nice little extra resource for uh, getting some extra viewings. And you can break down, just watch all their first passes, all their hits, whatever you want. You can just break it all down. So it's been a nice little uh, extra tool for us. And especially with our budget being lower, it's really extra valuable to, to a service like us. Lest people think we only ever see each other in Kitchener, obviously you're all over the place. I've probably seen you in just about every rink in the league now over the years. And you mentioned Todd Button before. We could probably put together a list of, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten guys that we see regularly. There's there's some um, camaraderie between the scouts. I know you're kind of competing for players, but you can't really help the draft order there. there there's a camaraderie amongst no, the scouts, it's, isn't there? It's a real brotherhood for sure. Um, you know, you know, you see Todd Button because he's in the area. So everybody has their, you know, their, there's there's guys that live in, in Kelowna. Well, obviously, you're not going to see them in Kitchener as much as as you see Todd Button, you know, and he and I are an hour away. Um, but yeah, we're there's there's games. I mean, Shakutami. <laughs> like I, I think about throwing on a game if I if I'm watching a game in Shakutami, and I can remember doing a Q trip. Um, and I actually jumped in with a different scout, with a team scout. And we left the airport in Montreal, drove to Shakutami. And for some reason, the next day, we really wanted to get back that night. So we left after the game in Shakutami, drove the five and a half back to the airport. So five and a half each way back to the airport. And I think it was a game in Blanville, uh, robbery on the next day. And uh, get there for an afternoon, a Sunday afternooner and... Uh, I think there was one player there that I didn't even really wasn't a big fan of. And then, you know, that was a probably a 4 p.m. and blame on Sundays is usually the time. So say 630, we get out of there and drove back to home five and a half. And so that's like a home at midnight or whatever. And, and I'm not complaining. I, I love doing this, but it's funny now when I throw on a game in Shakutami and it's like, boom, <laughs> it's three games in an hour. I was 11 hours on the road just to get there before I had the two and a half in the rink watching. And I was to see Pierre-Luc Dubois. I know the exact game I, I was there. It was late in the season and Pierre-Luc Dubois was, was visiting. So who's in the news of late? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned lists before, Mark, and I think this is pretty interesting too, because a lot of fans would see the lists that get put out by NHL central scouting because they go public. A lot of sports networks do their own like, top prospects, things like that. But then teams have their own lists too. Can you help us like figure out what these lists all mean and and how we might be able to get more meaning out of them? Yeah. So yeah, first of all, let's let's go to the NHL Central Scouting because their list has a certain purpose. And it is to basically give all the NHL teams players that they deem worthy of the scouts going to take a peek. OK, so that's why there's so many. I mean, what is there about? I think they go about over 200 in North America. They usually throw another 100 or 150 in Europe, at least. It, it varies as well because the players dictate, right, how long lists are. But you're talking 350 players. OK, a team's list might be anywhere from 90 to 130 players long. And even that is that's with some goalies in sometimes they'll make little offshoots to the list some i know some teams will have like a small player list they'll throw it off to the side or whatever right and and at a certain point of the draft they might say hey this guy's worth a shot here or whatever um so some teams are the, you know, the goalies on the same list other ones the goalies separate i i we did it combined this year i kind of like the goalies separate because I find it difficult where to slot them in. Whereas in the real draft, you would kind of know, okay, the goalies are starting to go, or we wanted to make sure we get 
this goalie, um, you know, we've got this many in the system, whatever. They have their kind of plan on how they're going to attack the goalies. Um, whereas ours is just, we're not a real team. So it's like throwing the list out. But when I look at where we have the goalie slotted sometime, it's like, well, we might have to take them earlier than that, or we wouldn't have to take them that early. Or, you know, this guy's a potential starting goalie. Why is he at 38? You know, that kind of thing. So the, the goalies is a little trickier, but I, <laughs> I digress. But I guess what I wanted to kind of get to here is, you know, our list, I think we just released, maybe it's about 106 or something. So it's a 106. So somewhere in that area of what a, an NHL team's list would be, right? From say 95 to say 150 on the high end, but the 150, they're not, they're not coming close to that. Like they're just not. So if you were to talk to some of the area guys that come in and, and talk, you know, you, you shoot the breeze with them on a Tuesday in Kitchener and said, you know, where do, where would you kind of want your guy to be on your list to kind of feel confident that you're going to draft them? They would probably say 65, 70. And if they're not in their top 70 on the team list, they start to get, I might not get my guy this year that I've been pushing for or whatever. So you got to remember, it's not like when we have a guy at 48, that's our pick at 48. We got 47 guys we're willing to take in the draft before that. And they're not disappearing right? Like with 46 picks before that in the same order, you know, we might be picking at 48 and get our guy who got at 24 that we've got 24 on our list, right? That's, that's more so what people don't get. And the same thing, like we've got, uh, I think 19 A rated players this year, there's 32 picks in the first round. So what we're saying is, yeah, we've got some kid, uh, you know, I've got Cowan, right? I think Cowan's like 29 or 28, something like that on our list. But he's a B player. We've got him rated as a B, like a second, third. Now, obviously, at 28, we're thinking he's a lot more of a B, a second rounder than a third, because he's one of our top Bs. But we don't have an A grade on him, even though he's in our top 32. So I think the, the main thing is when you see NHL Central and you see some kid at 180, you know, that doesn't mean he's going to be going somewhere around 180, pick 180 in the draft. He might, but typically that is more of a, of a list of here's who's out there. Here's NHL scouts who we want you to go take a peek at just so you're aware. Um, and it started many, many years ago, actually by Todd Button's father um, is, is who, who was the, the, the creator. Um, and it's just a resource. It's an extra resource for teams. They all pay into it. And uh that gives them an extra tool. And in a way, we kind of are too, right? We're an extra source to say, hey, hockey prospects got uh, this guy this high. You know, we don't have him up there. We're not going to say hockey prospects necessarily correct, but it's worth us to go take another peek. Maybe we've overlooked that guy, you know, watching him early in the air. I do it all the time. The Burns kid in Kingston, my first couple of viewings this year, I thought late pick. By the time the year was over, he's in our second round and I, I freaking love him. When you talked about team lists and if they're getting beyond 70, they might not get the guy that they were fighting for through the season. How much of that happens? I don't know how much you know about the NHL guys and, and their lists, but even at when you're putting get together the black book for hockeyprospect.com, how much back and forth goes into ultimately creating these lists? Uh, depending on the year, it can really go a lot. I, I can remember some years with, and you, you remember Ryan Yassi, who's now a Sudbury. Uh, I can remember you know, having probably about 27, 28 hours into the list. Now that's not obviously one sitting, that's a a, a group of meetings. Um, this year was, was less hours. This year was probably down to eight or nine total. Maybe it was, I don't know why necessarily it just uh, maybe, maybe part of it, just some of the scouts having less passion for some of the guys. So you're just not having these, these internal battles and, and, hashing out the pros and the cons and all that kind of thing. Cause we typically go in five player groupings, right. And you're just trying to group five and then see in the next five, if one of those guys can challenge the group ahead um, and go through and it, and it starts probably by, by position and league and all that kind of stuff. All of the area guys submit their list to me. So I have a general idea of what everybody's thinking before we start meeting. Um, and I'll do some individual meetings sometimes before a group meeting, that kind of stuff. I've done it every which way. Um, sometimes it's just because of availability, right? You don't want some guy who's, 
who's uh, doing high school hockey and some college in Madison, Wisconsin, Dustin, sitting there listening to five hours of conversations about players he doesn't watch right before we get to him in the meeting. So I'll, I'll typically make calls to uh, to Dusty on my own and get an idea of where he's at, which high schoolers, you know, I might have to focus in on. And this is done long before, you know, the spring is coming. Without giving away too many trade secrets, Mark, what goes into creating a solid player evaluation? How many viewings? What do you look for? Well, you're always getting better. Jerome and I, uh, Brube, who's our director of scouting, I named him director of scouting, scouting last year. And I've given myself a GM name because we just love all these fancy titles. But Jerome is, I think, in his 12th year, he's just been fantastic. Um, and we were talking this morning and made the mistake of uh, – Jerome opened up our 2018 black book in the first round <laughs> and it was like, Oh, just close that up because I don't care who you are. The mistakes just hurt. Everybody loves to trumpet the, the players they nail. You know, we, Matthew Nyes, we had at 11 a few years ago and he hasn't even done anything yet, but man, we're like pumping our tires that we had him and nobody had him and, and everybody loves to do that kind of stuff. And the kid hasn't even accomplished anything in the NHL yet. We're counting it as a win. But yeah, people don't like to focus on those those misses. And uh, it was, uh, what player was it? Jerome Red, we had a 21 and I just cringed. Noel, was it Noel in Oshawa? Was that oh that? yeah, Sarah Noel, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I said to Jerome, oh, that one was a killer. I remember I, I ranked him on the, on the good. Like he had games where he looked every bit of ranking him 21 and he had games where he looked like he should rank him 61. And we ranked him on the good that year and uh, he's in the East Coast League. So I think maybe I should have ranked him on the bad games. So, <laughs> but uh, what, what was the original question I've blabbed on there? Yeah. The, uh, oh, well, I... the, so the process of meetings and, and yeah. the Yeah. So just, uh, just some years it's like, it's, it's, Guys have passion and you'll battle it out. And, and then other years, you know, you kind of see things the same, um, you know, and we've got the same thing. We have kind of crossover scouts who watch everything and then guys who are only in area. So the area guys, you know, you just, you, you really, you really dive in with them on why they've got uh, a certain player so high on their list. If maybe the rest of us don't and, and uh, trying to learn, uh, you know, why they have so much passion for a guy and, and then piss them off when you don't. <laughs> <laughs> when when you're at a game and you're watching a particular player or players, what are you watching for? Yeah, so we started uh, a few years ago kind of grouping everything together. So the, the four main categories are hockey sense, compete, skill skating. And it's in that order of importance. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like hockey sense is, is like way, way more weighted of importance than skating, which is fourth. But I think it's important to have a process and an order. So for us, hockey sense is, is really important. Uh, and then compete and skill are next with compete, just having the edge. I know some teams. Um, in fact, one team I was dealing with one year, um, they had the same type of process. But when I was dealing with them and submitting, um, I had to flip the skill and compete because they had skill. I had to compete. Whereas I had compete, I had a skill. So those are really tight for us as well. Uh, but we'll go compete. And then, you know, so compete, you know, has a lot of that. That's like taking cross checks to the head in front of the net. That's, you know, being first on those pucks uh, and being in traffic and all that kind of stuff. And then people think work ethic. Well, work ethic is important. Yes. But that is, that's in that compete category. So a guy dogging it on the back check, you know, being lazy on a back check. Um, uh, Perot and Sarnia, that it, it bugged me a few years ago. He, he was a little bit, you know, selective on his hustle at times uh, with with the the actual work ethic. But compete wise, the kid would bring the puck to the net and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of different factors within one of those particular headings. Obviously, a skating, you know, the short area quickness, backwards edges you know, stability, the stride, you know, all that kind of stuff, the strength, um, Boone Jenner, Boone Jenner in the, um, do you remember they used to have the research and development camp for a yep. few years in Toronto? So it was like an August thing. Boone Jenner in that camp, you never would have thought in a million years you would draft him when you saw his skating. By the end of the year in the playoffs, I think they were playing Niagara. And I remember just being down on the glass to watch him really close in the corner. 
his skating came miles that year. Now he was still not Paul Coffey out there, but he became draft worthy based on his skating improvement from August to April. So the process is, is um, a three to nine scale in those four categories, hockey sense, compete, skill skating. Within those, we give a grade, three being poor, nine being elite. We're really picky with giving out the nines. And then everything in between, five would be average, six good, seven very good, eight excellent, uh, four is below average. And we just make all our scouts grade on those four categories. And it gives me a really good picture. Assuming they do a good job with their ratings, it gives me a really good picture. I can give you, a, this is a great example. So we obviously, we do the OHL draft as well. And we had a rookie scout and I sat in on the meeting and they were going around their areas talking about their top guys in their area. So one of them had his number one guy in his area and it was the ETA. And he said, yeah, he's a five, 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 five. Okay. So we, we speak in these, <laughs> the four digits being, cause we all know that the order, right? Hockey sense competes skill skating. So he was five in all those four. Okay. So there's other times in a meeting, we just go, he's a seven, six, four, four, six, you know, whatever. So he says he's a five, 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 five. This player could have been made up for all I knew. Okay. I had never seen him not didn't know how big he was anything but all i said was he's not an a player and he's like huh and i said well if your ratings are correct five 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 he's not an a player because you're not going to be average in four different categories and be a first round talent and he's like well he's first on my list i said yeah well you could have a c your your area could just be weak this year and have a c player as your number one player, right? And and maybe this guy turns out he is a C and that's the best you got this year and feel bad for you that that's what you're watching all year, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. So for me, not having a clue who this player was, never seen him, I immediately had, if our scouts ratings were correct, had an idea that the ETA probably wasn't fantastic in that particular year because uh, his top prospect was pretty much average across the board. How much has it changed over 20 years? Maybe not so much what you're looking for, but what you're actually seeing. Went through the small player being more accepted, right? Chris DeSeuss is a kid I coached, still in touch with him, ran into him in the playoffs in London. He's five, eight and a half, had 32 goals in his OHL draft season. I sat with him in the draft in Montreal and sat there and he's crying beside me, like just a horrible day. And he'd get drafted now right? Like if the same, that same five, eight and a half, the way he played the game, uh, the way he, he competed and he's carved out a great career. He's playing in Europe and, and doing great. Um, but <laughs> I told him <laughs> we we're sitting after the game and I said, yeah, Seuss, um, kid that could go as high as top five is five, eight and a half plays in winter. <laughs> he's like, dropped a few F-bombs, <laughs> right? Cause it's, 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 it sucks, you know, uh, but that's one thing I've got a lot better. Um, the process I just described has helped. It doesn't matter what scout you are. I don't care how great you think you are. Uh, you keep learning. You learn from your mistakes. Uh, the process helps. That, that was a 2018 black book I was referring to uh, with some rankings in there i just wish i could change but you can't and that's five years ago like i just i'm better just in those five years let alone back to 2012 when the black book started and all the way back to you know my first real scouting was uh the port hope predators my buddy was an assistant coach i met the head coach and he's like hey i got a guy uh down your way it was in uh oh like Port Burwell or something, I forget where I had to go junior B game and I watched some player they could buy for 15 grand. And that was kind of my first ever time out scouting. I wrote like a friggin' essay and said, like, don't pay it. And they didn't. So that was that was kind of the start of my scouting bug, I would, I would say. All right. So this is the OHL podcast. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the guys who we will definitely hear names called early uh, this weekend at the draft. I think it was Midland today where I read an, uh, an interview with you or parts of it in a story about Col Colby Barlow. I know you like him. We got Callum Ritchie. We got Oliver Bonk as well as three guys, I think, coming out of the O that we'll hear pretty early this weekend. Yeah, so Barlow gets my he's just a hockey player tag. Um, 
because he, he's got that compete element. He's got the hockey sense. Great. Right. Our, our number one category compete. Great skills. Next, uh, his shoot is ridiculously good. So that's one component of the skill. Um, and then the skating, which is our fourth on our importance is probably his weakness, but it's not a stopper. So when I say stopper, if you're five, eight defenseman and you're a four skater, I don't have to keep watching you, right? That's going to be a real uphill battle for you to play in the NHL, right? With something like that. With 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 Barlow, it's probably still a six on our on our three to nine scale. Um, so he's end up being sixth on our list. Um, our four to twelve ish is really tight, um, incredibly tight this year. The tightest. The tightest I can remember, and I, we, we just did our own little podcast the other day, and I asked the guys, and they agreed. This is the the most difficult it's been for us to rank kind of that top 10-ish. Obviously not the top, but the the 4 to 12 area was really tighter than I can recall in, in almost 20 years here. So um, next up would be uh, Bonk is our next OHLer, I think. Um, he's got a lot a lot, I think, room to grow in his game still. Like he's, there's a Russian that I said, he's like a baby, he's 6'5", and he's still a baby. He's got like a baby face and the kid's a monster. It, it kind of bonks a shrunken down 6'1 version of that. I think he's still a baby as far as his physical maturity and that, but that hockey sense rating at the front is really good. Um, the compete is probably an area where I'd like to see a little bit better. Um, he's not, he's not afraid. He's, he's just not naturally a real physical beast out there. He's, he, he gets involved. He's, he's in the battles, but you know, most of us would rather see guy just be a little bit more physical. And then the skill and skating are both, are both fine. I think there's, the, I think the skill is going to come a bit. The skating would probably be an area for him where some people would be concerned, but I thought it got better too as well. But the hockey sense is so good. Um, and I think the physical maturity factor that, um, there's, there's still a lot of room, like he's not close to his ceiling yet. There's, there's still room. Barlow, for example, is a little closer to, to his ceiling, like kind of what he's going to be, uh, if I wanted to contrast, give that example. Um, Richie was interesting because the kid's been hurt since Holenka. He got hurt in the Holenka. He's been playing hurt all year. Very difficult to evaluate, um, when you, you don't know if you're, you're watching kind of like some subpar play. And I, I, I say that try not to sound negative, but you know, how much did we not see because of a kid playing injured all year? Um, so that was tricky. Um, who else? Uh, Musty, Musty's a kid. I think at his best, he's a top 10 pick. He's kind of like that Noel kid I mentioned earlier at his worst. He's more like a, a maybe like a late second or an early third uh, when he's at his worst. And it's it's consistency with, I think, that compete area of the game. But that kid's incredibly talented. When I saw him in the good games, and I'm sure you saw him this year. I know I know one was one of his bad games was in Kitchener actually or in the year that I was at. But um, his good is incredibly good. Uh, he just he'll just scare you a little bit with some inconsistency. Uh, your team, Brustowitz, love the way that kid moves the pucks. Very high in the hockey sense. So if I go to that again, high in the hockey sense, the compete would be an area that I'd like to see better. Just kind of like this, uh, just kind of like no heartbeat at times. Just kind of like, I, I don't want to be sound too negative, but just sometimes it's kind of like, get mad, kid. Like, just show me you're, you're mad or something. Show a little more life in a battle or that kind of stuff, that kind of thing. But really, really smart. Love the way he moved pucks around. Uh, someone told me, I forget someone was talking to the kid, said, you know, why don't you skate it more? Or, or and he's like, oh, the coaches want me to skate it more, but I think I'm a better passer. So so I just keep moving pucks. And I can't argue with the kid because it's the strength of his game, you know. So, and then you got, um, who else? Cowan, Cowan is one of my favorites in this draft just because he's just my kind of player like he's he's just a pest he works his, his butt off and uh the hockey sense is uh, I almost argue his hockey sense is a nine um he I think he can play with with the best the NHL has to offer and not hurt the line because I think his hockey sense and he can move pucks and sees and the vision that kind of stuff even though his skills put probably closer to a six that kind of thing so that's that's a 
a, a few of them. It's not the best, deepest OHL crop this year, unfortunately. Uh, but those guys up there and, and some others are, are some pretty solid players. Just quickly on Cowan, you probably had a better read than I, but for me, he emerged during the season. All of a sudden, it's like, okay, I, I know I notice this guy now and I notice him for all the right reasons. Yeah, remember he was a rookie, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so he 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 was he was going through his draft year as a rookie, and he's not the first to ever do it. There's tons that do it, but at the end of the year, he's playing last minute of the game if they're down a goal, last minute of the game if they're up a goal. He's on the first PK and excellent at it. He, I, I can't say enough about the trust level Dale has uh, with him. And then I know Dale and Mark pretty well, so I've talked to 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 both of them about him. And uh, Dale is Dale is a lot of fun to talk to about players, you know, kind of, uh, and I know he's not the most like <laughs> in love with the media kind of guy. He's kind of just a quieter guy uh, in public, but, but when you get to know Dale a bit, like he's a lot of fun to talk hockey with because that guy knows the game inside out and obviously knows his own team. And you just watch the growth. I he, I don't have a comparable for Cowan other than little pieces like like the way um, like Evangelist on the on the PK, you know, to, to just stick with a couple of nights that were in the same system, and even a Bo Horvat level of of uh, trust. You know, I'm not saying <laughs> that he is Bo Horvat, but this the way Dale used them, that same trust level, the way he used those two players that's what it reminded me by the end of the year and Barky as well but Barky's a little bit smaller and and uh he's gonna have to be incredibly dynamic to play at his size love the player he's gonna be no matter what just rip apart the OHL here as he keeps going in his career but that was a fun line and uh and the the centerman that Seattle got in the third is a steal he's better than Shane Wright right now I'm glad you mentioned Brustevich too, because I mean, my bias notwithstanding having watched them all year. And I know what you mean about that, that fire and that compete, but a lot of times as a defenseman, when he's in trouble or there's pressure in his own end, you like to see that cool aspect of him, which I think I saw from Brustevich. He's poised. He's yes, poised. I guess poised. I just, I just wish it was like just a little more, more fire to him. And maybe I'm just picky. Scrum sweet, the scouts, we just become like miserable old bastards and you know, we want them to be everything we want them to be, but but that that would be the piece. If I could just change something about him, it would just be, you know what? Just show me you're pissed off once in a while. Shane Wright had that. Shane Wright, I just like, holy crap, Shane. Like, get mad at somebody. You know, cross-check cross -check somebody in the back just once after they slash you or something. Like, just show it. Right? It, it, it kind of does matter, these little things. <laughs> I'm going to save this. And now next time I call you a miserable old bastard, you're going to know why. Because you said it on the podcast. There it is. I've been <laughs> listen, called worse. It, I, I'm sure you have. Maybe even by me, but only in fun. Um, listen, for all the time we spent talking during the season, I appreciate you making time on this. We'll see you at the rink soon, but thanks for being here, Mark. Enjoy your summer, bud. Cheers. Cheers.